This whole idea of love while by doing good came out of thinking about what Jesus said, which is love God, love others as ourselves. So if I love God and I let God love me and I let God fill me up and I learn how to love myself, then I'm more fully equipped to love other people. Welcome to the Crucible Project podcast. The Crucible Project is a nonprofit organization committed to creating a world of men and women who live with integrity, grace, and courage, helping them to fulfill their God-given purpose. This podcast will discuss important and sometimes difficult topics while delivering practical life applications with men and women who are currently practicing this work. We are igniting Christ-like change in men and women through experiences of radical honesty and grace. Welcome back to the Crucible Podcast. My name is Joy, and I'm your host today. I'm here with Sandy Corrigan. Sandy, hey, how are you doing today? I am awesome because I'm on this with you, Joy. Oh, well, thanks for joining us. So, Sandy, can you tell us a little about yourself? Where are you located, and what are you up to? So, I live in Elizabeth, Colorado, about an hour southeast of Denver. I live on a small ranch with my Crucible husband, Tom Corrigan, and my two mares, horses, and my dog, Nala, who's a German Shepherd Husky. We have lived, I've lived here since 2000 and I have, Tom and I have a blended family. We have four daughters, three of which are in the area, one in LA, two married. I have three grandchildren, the most adorable boys in the world. And I have a granddaughter who is going to make me a great grandmother in October, which is impossible because I'm only 25. So... (laughs) Well, life is busy at the Corrigan Farm, huh? Yes. And at our ranch, we do uh, coaching with our horses and people. In fact, we just had a women's group out last Friday, and it was just always amazing to do that kind of soul work with horses. Different than Crucible, but still sell work. Uh, I also do uh, business coaching and uh, work with two nonprofits in the area. And I got in real estate in 2005. Such a great time. I say sarcastically to get into real estate because it was not a good time. However, uh, I spent quite a few years selling residential real estate and then became a leader in the organization, leading a team, and then buying into the franchise and becoming primary owner of that franchise, coached 57 multi-million dollar teams across the country. So I was very busy in real estate for a long time and then went through a really big life change and retired from real estate. Although I still say I like to do some staging and cash the checks, (laughs) but my husband is the one that leads the company. (laughs) Yeah. Well, so what I'm hearing through all of this is that you have a really rich history of working with a lot of people. A lot of times in transition, if you were doing residential real estate, you were working with people looking for homes and trying to figure out what came next for them, but also working with a lot of teens and adults and pouring into people so that they can be the best versions of themselves. So that's really cool. You know, I think it started because I'm the oldest of six and my next sibling is almost six years younger. So before Before I did soul work, I used to really tell my victim story around how I lost my childhood and blah, blah, blah. And then through the soul work, realized, wow, there were really a lot of gifts that I was given, you know, that God gave me in terms of really learning leadership at a really young age and responsibility and work ethic. And I think that whole investment in people at a young age. So now I really value being the little mom or the bossy sister, as my siblings call me. Uh, I really value value a lot about that experience because I think it set me up to always look for opportunities to contribute, to lead, to serve other people. I was in uh, the cosmetic industry for a long time, traveling around, serving people as a makeup artist and in training and leading in that company. And then I actually was a church planner for several years. And so that opportunity allowed me to you know, serve and lead people in that particular realm of life. So lots of opportunity to do that. What was the thing that made you say, okay, now is the time I want to figure out what this is all about? What brought you into soul work? Well, I had gone through divorce. Uh, I had lived on the East Coast, part of a big church on staff at a large church. And uh, my decision to do that was very unpopular and very difficult because of the kind of environment and culture that I was in. And so I after 18 years, decided that I needed to help myself, heal myself, help my children. And I chose to do that. 
That was really difficult. And I had always wanted to live in Colorado. So my mother was here. I had a cousin. I have a cousin who's like a sister and my brother was here. And I decided I've pretty much lost my home, my friends, my stuff. So I might as well move and I need a change. And so I moved to Colorado with my car and my clothes, pretty much it. My children were still in school, so they were finishing school. My hope was that they would be able to come here, which they eventually did. And when I got here, I was a single mom. And if anybody out there has been a single mom, it is being a mom's a tough job. And being a single mom is one of the hardest things I've ever done, certainly fulfilling I feel like I grew up, I went to college, I did a lot of independent things, but then I felt like I kind of went right from my parents' home into marriage. And so I don't really feel like I had this opportunity to really know if I could take care of me. And I call it the time of everything and nothing because I had nothing really materially. And like I said, I really had two friends left because I chose in that experience to only be responsible for myself and not anyone else. And so there was a lot of things people had to make up around what was going on. And in that realm, a lot of times then people, you know, withdrew. That was just what happened. And so I had to rely on God. I mean, it was such an incredible time. It was the most frightening, terrifying time of my life and the most exhilarating because now everything was possible. And I think for the first time I understood that God's love for me was just for me and not based on my performance. And I really realized through that experience that I had been performing for God all those years. Like I just wanted to be good enough at everything I did. And then that gave me validation that he loved me. And then once everything was gone, I didn't have that anymore. I, I really didn't even know who I was. So I wanted to give you a little bit of background around what was happening. So I met my husband, Tom. We were dating. My husband, Tom, had started soul work. Um, a couple of years before me. And he was actually the one that said, I really think you should consider this. And sometimes I wonder if we would have even gotten married if I hadn't made that choice, because I think we would not have been on the same plane. Like there is something amazing when two people in a relationship are both invested in their own soul work. I mean, it's made all the difference in our marriage. We've been married 22 years and we have a fabulous, the marriage I always wanted. So in 2000 around 2000, I can't remember if it's 2000 or 1999, I went to my first weekend and I was a mess. I mean, from that experience, I didn't know who I was. I was afraid all the time. I, in fact, when I left to start my new life, I thought God was going to kill me because in the environment I was, you didn't get divorced. I was living in a lot of fear. And I went on that weekend and literally from the time I got there till the time I left, I think I cried through the whole weekend and it was exactly what I needed. I realized on that weekend that I had lost my voice. And as outgoing, I mean, I'm a professional singer. I spoke on stage all the time. You'd think I'd have a voice. But through that experience, I had lost it. I didn't know how to even ask for what I wanted. I didn't even know what I wanted. I just knew that I was in tremendous pain, carrying around a lot of guilt, a lot of shame, and a lot of fear around all that had happened and, and all that I'd chosen. And so the weekend gave me the opportunity to really find my voice. And I'm grateful. I'm so grateful for that work. Sandy, you mentioned that you lost your voice at some point here. And when you went on your retreat, that's when you started to get it back. I'm wondering, before you went on your soul work retreat, what was blocking you from getting what you wanted in that time? Well, when I look back, I want to go back to that performance piece because I think that I was so steeped in an environment, maybe even, I'll say even before that, I was a theater major in college. There was a big performance drive for me. Also, the family of origin I grew up in, both of my parents were alcoholics. And the way that I got approval was trying to get great grades, performing as a great daughter, right? So this whole performance theme was so prevalent in my life that I think through that, I didn't even realize that I wanted people to like me and I wanted people to approve of me. And I got that validation by doing those same things as an adult, conforming, not speaking up. When I'd see something that wasn't correct, I didn't say anything because I wanted to belong. I wanted to make sure I was part of things. I wanted to make sure I was in the inner circle, you know? And so I look back at all the choices that I made 
made to shut my own voice down in that experience. And going on that weekend not only helped me get my voice, but it also helped me see that it was me. I mean, sure, everybody plays a part, but in order to heal, I had to look at the me in that place. What choices did I make along the way to just be silent or even comply when I knew things were going on that I didn't agree with, that I knew were wrong? So I didn't say anything. That was hard. And I still look at those tendencies of saying, do I say something? Do I speak up? Do I want people to like me in this experience? Will I say this? Will I give my opinion on this? I hope that I'm wiser about it all. I'm very aware of that shadow, that piece we you know, hide, repress, and deny in my life in order to want to be accepted and to belong. Hmm. The retreat that you did is, um, it sounds like it was a wonderful experience for you. It was with a different organization. Crucible for Women wasn't around yet, but now you are connected to Crucible. And I'm wondering what brought you to Crucible? Well, my first answer is going to be the Lord. And I, I don't say that lightly. Mm -hmm. I had been praying for a long time for an opportunity to be back in that work and have done things along the way in terms of my personal development, but for whatever reason, had not found a place anywhere where I could do that level of work. Because beyond my weekend, I actually went into the leadership track. I led groups of women for a few years following that. And then that organization just wasn't as involved in the area that I was in anymore. And my life changed. I was going through different things. Mm -hmm. And so I actually went to a graduation with my husband. My husband had staffed a weekend and I went to a graduation with Northern Colorado, Wyoming group. And one of the men there started talking to me about the women's weekend. And there was a women's weekend coming up and he said, oh, oh, you should get involved. You should get involved. And I mean, I got to admit, it was a little overwhelming. It was like, whoa. But it was exactly the right timing for me. And I really appreciated the leaders on the weekend because I think it was only maybe a month away. So I hadn't gone through, you know, some of the things we typically go through before a weekend. And so they got me up to speed. So that was my first weekend staffing and really seeing how the Crucible weekend worked similar to the weekend I went through and different. I loved and love the fact that we are based in the Lord and that the Lord and the Holy Spirit are very much a part of the whole weekend. And that just fits with who I am. So as much as I got out of the other weekend, it just felt like even better because that piece of my spiritual life was able to be involved in this as well. I was afraid to come. I think for that same thing I talked about, Joy, which is how will I be seen? How will I be accepted? Will this be a group of women who will help me belong? I haven't been in the group before, so I'm coming in as an outsider. And I really wanted to be involved, but I felt at risk, not because of any of the things any of the women or the organization did, but because I realized I was still bringing some of this into the experience. And maybe I'll always have some layers I've got to peel off. That'll always be part of my work. I found, however, I, there was nothing to be afraid of. And I was just wholly held, accepted, invited. So it was a wonderful experience, both staffing to see the work women did. And it was also just a wonderful experience for me to be welcomed in that way, which hasn't always been the case for me and groups of women. Well, and like you said, you know, with that shadow that you've talked about of not knowing when to use your voice and if you even have a voice and if it's worth being heard, showing up in a community of other women or just people. Anytime that you're the new guy, it's the question of what should I say or do I say anything? Am I better to be a fly on the wall? Should I come out strong and be like, woo, the voice that leads things? How do I show up here? And so when, you know, with the shadow that you mentioned, that makes sense of having that fear to step into it. And I'm so glad to hear that it was such a positive experience for you. You know, we talk about staffing our weekends a lot. You know, if you're new to Crucible, when we say staffing, once you go through a Crucible weekend, you are invited to come back and serve others as they go through theirs. And there's many different roles that people do on our retreats. And so there's a place for everybody. But when you come back, one of the things that blew me away as a staff member coming back was the amount of work that I continued to do, even though I wasn't the one going through the retreat. It's that idea, you know, we say one man's work is every man's work or one woman's work is every woman's work, that there was so many things that I related to in watching other people get into the dark 
or sometimes not dark, but the deeper places of their soul and work through the things that have been holding them back from being who God intended them to be. As you stepped into staffing, you know, with a new organization, but even as you've continued in Crucible, can you share some of what you've gotten for yourself or some of the work that you've continued to do through staffing and being a part, you're on the leader track um, with Crucible and doing classes on how to become a certified leader with what we do. What is that doing for you and your soul now? Well, we don't have enough time on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Talk, I'm, seriously, this is one of the best things that has just happened to me in the last 20 years is finding a place to be able to do this with other people that are dedicated and committed to do their own work. So we're doing our work alongside one another. And I think that I always admire that, that when I'm in a group, a leader that's in the group, the leader that's in the group is working alongside me in many of the same ways. So in my coaching work, I help organizations take hierarchy out where the mission becomes the boss. And now we all have a role to play. And I very much feel like Crucible does that too, right? We have a mission. That mission is the thing we all serve. And then we all have a place in the mission to do that. And it looks different for everyone, but it doesn't feel hierarchical, like somebody's better than somebody else. It's just different because we have different roles to play. So that's refreshing, first of all. I don't always find that in organizations, not for profit or for profit. Every training is designed in such a way for all of us to do the work. So it's not just somebody up there talking about how we should do something. It's someone teaching and then us practicing with one another. And in the practice, even on Zoom, I end up doing deep personal work, which is so good. I feel like the organization, we're not just saying one thing and doing something else. We're teaching something and we're all in it and we're on in it on a regular basis. I also think the thing that has been interesting for me, when you said you come into an organization should I say something? Shouldn't I say something? So I've got this, I want to be liked. And I also have this leadership piece. So I've also gotten, you're too much. You're too out there. You're too outspoken. You're too bossy. You're too know-it-all. I don't think anybody's ever called me a know-it-all, but I think I've thought to myself, I don't want to be one. So then I probably have the tendency to be that. So it's just this opportunity to really be able to be in an environment where I get the chance to look at it and I get to look at how is it showing up, not just here, but in all of the rest of my life. And then to be able to come back and be able to do some talking and work and, and process and experience around that. Soul work is not for the faint of heart. And soul work is what makes me feel alive and makes me feel like I'm becoming like Jesus, right? You know, I want to become more like Jesus. Well, then I got to be able to look at all the parts of myself that are not like that and also celebrate the parts of myself that are becoming more like that. And so I think, you know, every opportunity in the trainings and in the work that we do gives us the opportunity to do that if we let it and if we're honest. Well, Sandy, thanks for sharing all of that. And, you know, I heard you say earlier about having the message of not having a voice and needing to to be quiet. And I heard you say, uh, you know, just a minute ago about playing small. With Crucible, something I've personally found is that when I dig in and start doing some of that soul work and I find a message that has been sticking with me um, since, you know, sometimes early, early childhood, the next message isn't too much farther down. And then I unearth the next message and then there's another message in there. And that's part of why we say the journey of soul work never ends. We just say the journey continues because there's more, there's always more to do. So I'm wondering if you would be willing to share with us some of the messages that you're working through now or some of the work that you're wrestling with as you work on finding your voice and not playing small and stepping into more leadership and and being a great grandma and like all of these things that life continues to throw at you. I'm going to take you back about a year and a half. My daughter, my oldest daughter has chronic Lyme disease. And so she and uh, my grandchildren lived with us for a summer last summer, not last summer, the summer before. And I was really dedicating so much of my life. I had the freedom with my work to be flexible. And I was dedicating so much of my life to helping her and my grandkids. We didn't know what she had. The reason I mention that is that coming out of this season where she is better, we found a doctor who is helping her be better once we 
found out what she had. I found myself at this place where it's like, wow, I've been dedicating all of this time to like work and this. And I found myself in a, a state of depression. And I think it was because I didn't have like next goals. I had things I was involved in and some goals around those things, but I didn't have like a next me goal, like something for me, something that was going to get me out of bed every morning in a more significant way. I've lost 76 pounds. Yay me. And I'm going to tell you this because there's a lot of people who are going to be listening that are like, how did you do that? Right? And the first thing that had to happen is to realize I was hiding. So I think somewhere in there, I was still hiding me right in that weight. I was still doing things that were medicating the thing that I didn't want to face. And so I began on that journey primarily because I had some blood work come back around my A1C and things, you know, to make me pre-diabetic. And I was like, whoa, I am, I better deal with this now because this could be an issue. So I did find a great doctor to help me do that. And I've taken that weight off. Well, as I've taken that weight off, and began to journal and to think about and to be in groups where I started to go, what else is this about? I realized it was also one of the ways that I could play small because there has been times where I feel like I'm a threat because when I'm heavier, I'm not so much of a threat. Maybe I'm not as attractive or whatever, or at least that's what I make up. And also that's how I'm treated sometimes, you know, so there's both, do I make it up and I think I'm in an environment where that's happened before. And so as I've done that, um, I realized that one of the things I do is also need to get stronger because when I, when we lose that kind of weight, then there's stuff that needs to get firmed up and strengthened. And so I was actually going to enter a bodybuilding contest because I thought I need a goal. I can't just say, I want to get stronger. I actually need a goal and accountability and all that stuff to be able to do it. But I just felt like it wasn't enough. I felt like that's only one part. I feel like I need to set a goal that starts to stretch me physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, financially, relationally. What could that be? You know, what kind of goal could I select that could involve all of that? And I can't really tell you other than it felt kind of out of the blue that I just decided I landed across something, I read something, and I decided that entering the Mrs. Colorado pageant next year in 2025 was going to give me that goal. First of all, I you have to wear a one-piece bathing suit. Thank God it's one piece and not a bikini. And so the thought of like parading in front of thousands of people in that is really motivating. It's really been an incredibly motivating <laughs> <laughs> to be able to think about that. And also I realized I'm 68. I will be 69 when I compete. Quite honestly, there are not a lot of women my age that are competing in this kind of thing. And I started realizing that a lot of women, myself included, we can feel really done. Like, oh, we're a grandma and we're a mom and we're a great grandmother. Or we're, you know, whatever. And that's nice. Or we volunteer some places or maybe we have a job, but it became so easy for me to start to get more complacent around the full me out there. And so I chose to do that. And in that process, you um, submit an application and are interviewed and you select a local title because there's not a competition for that. So I am Mrs. Front Range, Colorado, 2025, and that will allow me to compete next April. Now, what started out as this really personal kind of get in shape, stretch me, I realized there was a moment moment where I felt like God said, ask everyone to be involved in this because I am doing so much more than you thought was going to happen through this experience. And it just kind of blew me away. And I have had on my signature on my email for a long time, love well by doing good, because in the coaching practice that we do, and really in the work that I've done for a long time in organizations, if we don't know our why, then we don't really know our purpose in the world. If we don't really know, like, what's mine? What would get me up every day? There were a lot of years before messing around with this for me to articulate that my wise love well by doing good because a really good why, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what job you have or what role you play because every day I can get up in the morning and say, what does love well by doing good look like? What does love well by doing good look like on this podcast with Joy today? How do I do that? Or when I go to the grocery store 
or when I'm driving or when I'm talking to my kids or love always looks like something. You know, you're encouraged in this kind of experience to think about, well, if you win this title, what you're winning is really being an ambassador for the state of Colorado or America or the world if you get to compete at that level. So what are you going to stand for? What are you about? And I realize there's a number of things. One is that love well by doing good. How can I inspire the world to get up every day and think that and do that? So that's one of the big passions of my heart is to inspire other people to ask the question. And then what group of people would I really like to inspire? Certainly all people. We all want to help all people, but that's women. And and I love women business owners or women that are leaders in organizations. So I'm like, oh my gosh, like this is the perfect alignment. I love that this is taking me and stretching me to be that kind of voice of impact in the world. I love that I get to be part of Crucible also because I was in a group where this idea of doing more and being more came to me was actually in a crucible group. And it was in an exercise of looking at myself and having others even speak into kind of both the challenge and the the shadow and the goal. Here's the thing you could work on that's showing up. Don't hide it. Don't repress it. Don't deny it. And here's the thing we see that's amazing. Can you bring that out more? That I really came upon this decision to put myself out there and to play bigger in the world. And in my mind, as I'm going through this journey, I have to fight that I'm going to be 69 and there are going to be 30-year-old women that are amazing and not get into a competitive spirit, but just to say, no, this is just about me competing for me and not even against me and being able to make that impact. And so I do visualize the opportunity to spread the word of loving well by doing good. I do am already spreading the word around do your soul work, right? Like I can't just work on the outside of me. This particular goal is taking everything I have on the inside of me. And boy, are things popping up. Mindsets, belief systems, behaviors. So Crucible is so terrific for me because I get a place to be able to go express and work on that stuff that could become blocks for me in the whole experience. And so there's just such a great marriage, I guess, in the school. And I have to not roll my own eyes or laugh at myself sometimes when I tell people because I'm waiting for their reaction. You're doing, you're entering a beauty pageant. Well, first of all, it's not. 50% of your score is your interview and public speaking. And the other 50 is how you carry yourself in all those other ways. I think when any of us choose to do something at a competitive level with ourselves, with other people, it's really a terrific opportunity to look at all the stuff inside that can hold us back from doing those kind of things. And I've had to just say things like, what you think of me about this is none of my business, unless you're going to be my supporter or encourager. (laughs) If you're going to be my critic, unless you have something really helpful (laughs) to help me keep going. You know, I said, uh, I think when I announced it, be like Thumper's mother. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Now, I do want honest people in my life that um, I trust that are willing to speak into the areas I can't see in my blind spots just to help me be better and keep going, not to put me down. So, and we all need that. So thanks for asking. I'm very excited about the chance to promote Crucible through the platform of what I'm doing. Yeah, it's very exciting. I'm excited for you. And, you know, I think about that quote from the man in the arena and the idea that it's not the critic who counts. It's the man who's in the arena, whose face is marred by blood and sweat and tears. You know, I think of that in terms of soul work. It's easy for us to criticize other people. But man, when you're willing to get into the arena and say, I'm going to just making it through this life is not enough. I want it to mean something and I want it to matter. And the way that it matters is by how we love others. That is something to witness. And so what I see with you, Sandy, is stepping into, you know, this new endeavor is not doing it for being another, just another contender or another face in the crowd, but you're saying, I'm going to put myself into an arena and I'm going to get my face dirty with (laughs) blood and sweat and tears. I have something to say that matters and I have something that I care about that I want to share with the world and a gift to bring to the world and what a way to have a voice and what a way to not play small. That's really, really powerful. Well, thanks. This whole idea of love well by doing good came out of thinking about what Jesus said, which is love God, love others as ourselves. So if I love God and I let God love me and I let God fill me up and I learn how to love myself, 
then I'm more fully equipped to love other people. And I want that to be a message also. So this is my way of working that out, right? If I love myself well in this experience where I can impact and inspire other people, especially women, to love themselves because we are not good at it. I want to impact women because I am one. And I understand what a struggle that's been for me for my life is to love myself well. And the balance between loving God and loving other people and making sure I'm in there loving myself well and realizing that if I don't, I can't really love God or other people well. I want to be able to be someone that helps women say, what can I do to step into a place where when I love myself well, that it really can be the greatest impact I can make on my family in my community, in my job, in the world. I have been toying with the idea and its inception, I guess, of creating a community where I can help women do that even more profoundly. I mean, certainly crucible in the soul work is one way. And there's a lot of other things that I feel like I could bring to help women, what I call glisten, be out there. In fact, the definition of that is actually a reflection that manifests itself in luster and brilliance. And so I love the whole idea of that we're a reflection, right? If I'm a reflection of Jesus, I'm incredibly beautiful in every way. And so are you as we are a reflection of him. And so what does that look like for each one of us? And how could I encourage women to like step it up, listen up, girl, listen up. (laughs) I don't know what that will look like. I'm messing around with um, doing that. Yeah, more to come. That's very exciting. I just had this group of women doing this equine experience. And when we got done, we had people tell a little bit more about themselves. And I asked the question, what are you celebrating about yourself today? And that was way harder than having a woman tell us what's wrong about her. And we had everybody do it and we had them stand up and take a bow and clap. And I just realized, you know, it's easy for us to go look at all the things wrong with us. And I want to, like, I want to look at those things that are the negative shadow that pulls me down. And I want to look at those things that are brilliant and amazing and incredible that I put away too, because I'm afraid of what kind of reaction I'll get from the world. And so I just just realize in my life, I want to be a champion of both. And I also want to be a champion of celebration, of being able to pull out the brilliance in another person and have us all celebrate that. I mean, that's how God sees us. He sees all that stuff, but I think God really sees us through that filter of Jesus and all he sees is what's incredibly amazing. <laughs> and uh, so I want to be more about that in the world. And it is the balance of both. Thank you for being part of my journey both in the group and here. And I really appreciate you. Your name fits you perfectly. (laughs) Every time I'm with you, that's how I feel. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you. Yeah. And you know, as we seek to love God with all of our heart, in our mind and our strength and our soul, um, it's that idea of how can you love well by doing good if you don't even know your own soul? How can you love God with that soul? How can you love others if you want to ignore that soul and not get to know it and understand the shadows, understand the gold, see what's really there? So Sandy, thanks for digging in. Thanks for thanks for loving God with your heart and with your mind and with your strength. Um, you know, as you do that bodybuilding and <laughs> do that lifting and your soul and for loving others through that too. Um, you are a gift. So thank you for your time today. We'll see you in group next week. Thank you, Joe. And I just want to say, there's anybody listening out there that has yourself, a spouse, a friend, a sister, a someone, just don't hesitate to invite them. You know, a lot of times we don't do things because we don't get an invitation, a personal invitation. I have also learned that sometimes it takes 12 of those for someone to actually come. But this is one of the best things that anyone can do for anyone else is to help somebody get involved. Hmm. And maybe you're listening and you aren't involved, then get involved yourself. But um, (laughs) this is your invitation. (laughs) Or call me up and I'll talk to you. But yeah, it's just, you know, we need to all be together in doing more to perpetuate this work and to get people involved. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to spur somebody on towards that and invite them in. Thank you. For more information about our weekends, please go to thecrucibleproject.org. Or if you're ready to get started on your transformational journey right now, you can connect with one of our Crucible certified coaches for a free 30-minute session at thecrucibleproject.org backslash coaching. That's thecrucibleproject.org backslash coaching. If you like what you heard, connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Rate and review wherever you are listening. And don't forget to subscribe on your preferred podcast platform. Thank you for listening.